email headers explained, and more. Hi everyone, I'm Leo Notenboom for AskLeo.com, where I've been basically explaining email headers to people since 2003. I often refer to the headers that you don't see in email. Uh, there's a lot of information that gets carried along with every email message that gets sent. I th honestly think you'd be very surprised, you're about to be very surprised, at just exactly how much information is being carted along every time you send an email message or receive an email message. Most of those headers are things that you don't see. Most of those headers are things you don't need to see, to be honest. They just don't really have anything to do with your ability to read, write, consume, or send email. However, every once in a while, it can be really, really useful to take a look at some of the email headers. So I'm going to explain a few of them. There is no way I'm going to be able to explain them all for two reasons. One, they're simply too many. Two, they're simply too geeky. And three, I don't know what all of them mean but I do know what the important ones are. And those are the ones that I want to show you. So let's switch over to Outlook.com running on my Windows 10 machine. And you can see that we've got an example message here. This is actually a simple two line message with an attachment uh, that's been sent from my Gmail account directly to a Hotmail account. Ask Leo example at Hotmail.com. And I'm viewing it, like I said, on the Outlook.com website. It seems very, very simple. Now, there are, of course, the headers you see. You can tell that this is from AskLeoTest, AskLeoTest at gmail.com, the Gmail address that I referred to. There is, of course, a subject, a test message for us to use. There's a date. This is the date that the message was sent by the sending email service. And of course, there's a two line. Now, what's weird about Outlook.com is that what they're saying is to you. They're assuming that you know your own email address. Um, occasionally, that could be a bit of an assumption, but that's really the two line and the fact that the two lines email address, in this case, AskLeoExample at Hotmail.com, matches the account for which I'm currently logged in. Now, what you're not seeing in this example, because I haven't used them, um, are the CC lines. If there were CC carbon copied email addresses, there would be an additional line that includes a list of what those would be. And of course, you would never see a BCC line because that kind of defeats the purpose of BCC. If a sender included email addresses on a BCC line, the whole point is to not include that information in the email that the recipients actually see. So viewing hidden headers. So there's a lot of gory details in this message that we don't see. Here's what we do. We will click on the message list, the item up in the message list. I'm going to right click on it. And then you'll see all the way down towards the bottom of that list is something called view message source. And we'll click on that. That opens a window window like thing that basically has the entire message source. Now, it's not particularly useful. Um, it's useful if you're doing a quick scan of what you want to look for. But in our case, since we're doing something a little bit more detailed, what I'm going to do instead is I'm actually going to click at the top of the message. So my cursor is right there in front of that received. And I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom, right click on it and click on copy. So I've copied the entire source into the clipboard. Now I'm going to run Notepad and paste the source into Notepad. Now I'm going to go ahead and go all the way back to the top of the message so it starts to look a little bit more familiar. This is what's really sent when you send an email message. So there's a couple of things that we need to, uh, a couple of definitions I'll say that we need to look at. First, everything, and I do mean everything, up until the first blank line, which I'm looking for right here, there's a blank line. Everything above this blank line is what we're referring to as an email header. Everything after the blank line is the actual body of the email. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a moment too. Also, the other important thing to realize is that email headers have a specific format. And they are, that is, I should say, um, I'll use this message, this header since it's on screen. 
The format of a header is a line beginning with some amount of text that does not include a space, a colon, and then another space or an end of line. You can see that there's a space here in front of this preceding header, but it's the same thing. Some amount of text, a colon, and a space. That defines the beginning of a header line. In this one, X message delivery, the entire header exists on one line. Anything that does not begin with this text colon space is considered to be a continuation of the preceding line. So from a header's perspective, this entire set of headers up until the very first thing that again looks like a header is a single header. We're not going to talk about this one because honestly, I have no idea what it means, but it's a great example of a multi-line header. We often think of headers being a single line, but in fact, they can span multiple lines and there are going to be a few cases coming up where that happens to be true. The other thing I want to talk about very briefly is this concept of multi-part. One of the headers, uh, it's actually line 55, I'm told in our example, is something that says multi-part. This one right here, content type multi-part mixed with a boundary. That boundary is actually an arbitrary string. They happen to use random numbers in this case. It doesn't have to be a random number. I've actually made these by hand and they can be anything. But what this is telling us, what the content type header tells us is that when we get to the body, when we're after that first blank lines, what follows is going to be a multi-part message. It's going to have multiple parts to it and they're going to be mixed parts. In other words, each part might be different from one another. And the boundary, this line of text here, this, this um, uh, zero is followed by this random number here, that's going to be the indicator of a boundary. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to copy that to the clipboard and now search for it using a notepad's search. And you'll see that the next instance of that number is on this line. That is a boundary line. When it begins with two dashes followed by that number, that's a boundary and it's the beginning of the message. Now, if we look for this string again, you'll see that it's all the way down here. That's again, the boundary, everything in between, even though it includes what looks like more boundaries, that's a single item. That's a single multi-part item in this multi-part message. This first multiple part, it's the body of the message. This whole thing that I've got highlighted right now is the body of the message. This other thing, the other multiple part, well, you can see the content type here is image slash PNG, and it has a name of logo 2019. That's the file I attached. And that is the second part of this two part multi part message. And in fact, now we'll just start scrolling because you'll see that the entire PNG file has been included here as a part. And then down at the very end of the message is the last instance of that boundary number two dashes in the beginning saying that it's a boundary and two dashes at the end saying it's the last boundary of this type. You'll notice that that PNG was actually pretty big. That's because email actually doesn't handle binary data, or I'll just say the email protocols are designed in such a way that email transports and email clients don't have to understand binary data. What that means is that anything that is binary data, like a PNG file, is actually converted into this encoded text format. You can see here that it says content transfer encoding base 64. That's one of the ways that binary content can be encoded into text. But that's what this second part is. Now, to go back to the first part, the body of the message, this part here between the first two instances of the boundary, it's got its own content type. So that first part is itself a nested multi-part message. The body has two parts. And the two parts here are a plain text version of the message. So you can see that it's just plain text. And then a second part 
in that multi-part that is the HTML version of the message. And you can see that there is the entire message, this time with a bunch of HTML encoded in it. So I wanted to get that kind of stuff out of the way. The whole concept of multi-part messages is a little confusing, especially when it nests like this. But when a message includes multiple things, and our message here has both a body and an attachment, and that body has two different forms, both plain text and HTML, that's how these multiple things are all included into a single email message. The first thing I'm going to do is search for a header that we expect. And I'm going to search for the from header, F-R-O-M colon space. Remember I said it was text colon followed by a space for the beginning of a header. And sure enough, there it is. I'll go ahead and cancel the search and we'll scroll up. So here we can see the from line. This is the information that was provided by the sender to say who this message was from. You'll also see the date. This is the date that uh, Outlook.com showed us. You'll also notice that it includes the time zone. We'll talk a little bit more about time zones in just a second. There's this other header in here called message ID. I'm not going to say a lot about that other than to say it is nothing more than an identifier that only in this case, Gmail will understand. It's actually created by the sender as a way for them to track internally what that's happening to the message. The subject, there it is, a test message for us to use. And of course, to who the email was being sent to. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this is that these to you and me might be considered the most important header. Who sent it? Where's it going? What's the subject? That kind of thing. But they're buried in all of these other headers. I mean, you know, the easiest way to find it was to search for it because it's very difficult to just sort of scan this and suddenly find the from line. So that's why the hidden headers are hidden, because for the most part, you really don't want to see them. Now, there are a set of headers that we're mostly going to ignore. And those are the ones beginning with X dash. X dash means that they are an extension to the standard headers that are included in most email messages. They are, and you can see can be unique to the email systems that are involved who created the headers. For example, X MS exchange organization expiration start time reason whatever, whatever that means, I don't know, but you can tell that that's a Microsoft specific email header that was not placed there by Gmail. Cause of course, Gmail doesn't have a Microsoft specific email header. Same thing with Gmail. There are, I believe some uh, Gmail specific headers in here as well, like up here, X GM message state and X Google DKIM signature. We'll talk about DKIM in a minute, but the fact that there's a Google specific header in here, again, we don't know necessarily what it means. For the most part, we don't care what it means. And for the most part, it doesn't matter what it means. They're generally going to be things that are internal to whatever system or whatever server decided they needed an extra email header to track whatever it is they're trying to track. There is one X header that I want to talk about, and that is the X dash sender IP header. You can see that it's here and it has an IP address associated with it. I want to be clear about something that is not the IP address of the person that sent the email. If you actually research that specific IP address in our example, you'll find that that's an IP address of one of Google's mail servers which as you would expect is what it is. That's the mail server that sent the message. Like I said, it's not the IP address of the person that sent the message. In years past, there has been a header X dash originating dash IP that is not included in this email that used to, in some cases, for some email services, include the IP address of the person that was sending the email. Again, that's not here, and it's generally no longer available for privacy reasons. 
One of the reasons many people try to look at email headers is to find out who sent it at the IP address level. I want to bring to your attention right now that that's generally not possible. The best you can do is find the email server, in other words, the email service that initiated the send of the email message. Which actually brings us quite nicely to what are the routing headers. Received colon is another one. Now, what I want to do here, I'm going to start at the from line, and this time I'm going to work my way backwards. I'm going to work my way up the message, looking for received colon space. And you'll see that that actually doesn't occur right away. In fact, let's just go ahead and search for it. Received colon space, and I want to look up from my current position. X received doesn't count. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something that a line that begins with the word received. And there it is. This is the first received header. And you can see that it is a two line header uh, because the second line of it does not match this text colon space. There was a space present before a colon was seen, and that implies that this is a continuation of the preceding line. So what is this message telling us? This message is telling us that this message was received by this Google server with some information and who it was for and the time that it was received. My interpretation of this is that since I know that I sent that message using Gmail's web interface, that this is the first email server in Google's infrastructure that received that message to be prepared to send, that it received it from whatever servers handle the Gmail web interface. This is the first one that actually got it all packaged up as an email message. Now we keep looking, right? We're going to look backwards again to find the next one. There's another one. Now, this one is a little bit more interesting. Once again, it's a multi-line header, and it says it's received from a Google server, which coincidentally happens to be the same server that we saw on the previous line with its IP address by an Outlook.com server with its IP address with what the software was used at Microsoft's SMTP server with some information about how it was encoded and more information about how it got there. And once again, the date and the time that it was received. You can see this time that the time has changed format. So this is the next server in the chain. Gmail sent it to Outlook. This line represents the jump between the two email systems. The time in this case is represented as UTC. That's because it's the plus 0000, zero, zero, zero representing the time zone. The previous timestamp had a minus 0700, which is the time zone that I live in, Pacific Daylight Time. The time is the same. You'll notice that in UTC it's 2019.43, but in Pacific Daylight Time it's 13.19.43. It's the same time, simply represented two different ways. This allows us to see exactly at what time the message was received by Google. And you can see it took almost no time at all to get there. Now we'll go back again and there's another server. This time it was received from an Outlook.com server by an Outlook.com server. This is also incredibly common. Microsoft has multiple servers as part of their infrastructure. So does Gmail. So do many other email services. You will find it not at all uncommon for a message to be handed off from one server to another server to another server before it reaches its final destination. Each of those servers will add a received colon space header to the message as it makes its way across them. That's why this is so very, very interesting. Here's another one received from and we're at the top of our message. This was the last header that was added to the top of this message. So the last server that actually handled this message before we got to see it is this one, another randomly named Outlook.com server. So there are three reasons that received headers are so incredibly interesting. You can use them to make sure that the email actually came 
from the service that it claims to have come from. For example, if you get email that is quote unquote from a gmail.com address, and yet if you look at the email headers, it never touched a Google server, that's suspicious. Similarly, you can ensure that the chain of servers is complete. As you saw, each server in this chain referenced the server that it got the message from, creating a chain of this one to this one to this one to this one. If that chain is incomplete, or better yet, if in the middle of that chain, another server just sort of magically appears without having actually received the message from a server ahead of it, that is suspicious. That is one of the techniques that spammers can use to try and fool the system into understanding its message as being spam or not. And of course, everything had a timestamp. This is probably what I end up using headers for the most. This is a wonderful way to understand why a message took as long as it did. You can often see exactly where a message may have been held up in transport. There are many reasons that email can be legitimately held up as it makes its way from point A to point B. Looking at the timestamps on the received headers can tell you exactly where, not necessarily why, but it can tell you where that delay occurred. There are a couple of other headers I want to talk about very briefly because they take up a lot of space and they have to do with spam. The first one is the DKIM signature. I'll just search for DAI, DKIM signat because that'll show me this line here, DKIM signature. Now remember our rules for multiple line and you'll see that this particular header actually goes all the way down to here, and it includes a lot of interesting encoded information. The DKIM, or Domain Keys Identified Mail header, uses a cryptographic signature to confirm that email claiming to have been sent by a specific domain, gmail.com in this case, actually has been sent by that domain. It is one of the ways that email providers fight against spam. And you can see that Google itself adds an additional DKIM signature. Not sure what they're doing with it, but it is not at all uncommon to find multiple DKIM signatures depending on exactly what the message was about and how it was routed. The important one is the first one, and that's the DKIM signature colon all by itself. That's the signature that was added by the original originating email sender. The other one that I want to talk about very briefly is the SPF record. It's the received SPF record. And you can see it's right there underneath. Once again, it is a multi-line header. And you can see that it says received SPF pass. This is another anti-spam header. What it does is it confirms that the server that was sending the email, in other words, the Gmail server that actually sent out the email is authorized to send out email on behalf of gmail.com. This prevents or can prevent other servers from trying to imitate gmail.com. Now I do have to throw out a caveat for both of these anti-spam records is that while they sound like they could be definitive, they're either true or they're false, they're right or they're wrong, they can be used as absolute detectors for spam, they can't. At best, they can be used in an advisory role. They are, I'll say, data points that can be used by the anti-spam software that is analyzing your message along the way to understand just how likely it is that a message may or may not be spam. Unfortunately, not all message transport handle these kind of records properly, which means they can't really be handled in an absolute sense. They can really only be used as advisory data points. So as you can see from this message, there is so much more in the headers. Um, it's actually crazy how big these headers have become over time. The majority of it has to do with spam, uh, but a lot of it is simply the various email transports, in our case today, Outlook and Gmail, 
adding the information that they can use internally to keep track of the message and make sure that it gets to where it's supposed to go. You'll find all of this, including a downloadable version of this example message on the website. Uh, the original article for this video is askleo.com slash 126191. Uh, it goes into some of this in a little bit more detail. It includes related links, any updates, and of course, comments. So do visit askleo.com slash 126191 if you're at all interested in delving into this a little bit further. For now, that's it. I'm Leo Notenboom. This is askleo.com. Hope it was helpful. Thank you.